Welcome to the exercise class. So today's exercise class will be, in some sense, the repetition of the lecture. Um, we'll go again through the, through the pigeonhole principle in when the, these pigeons are quantum, and also look at the like, general definition of pre- and post-selection paradoxes, and, um, ha and, and then just have a, uh, an example of a pre- and post-selection paradox, and we'll show why it is in this framework we can see that, indeed, um, it can identify paradoxes. Okay, but let's start with the pigeons, which I'll start with the usual scheme that Lydia also described in a lecture where we have two boxes or holes somewhere where the pigeons can be. So we have one box, second box, and then we have three pigeons. Yeah, and it's a known uh, classical principle that we have uh, three pigeons. We have our three pigeons and two boxes, then classically um, at least two of these pigeons must end up in the same box. And this is also called uh, classically as Dirichlet principle. This can be generalized to the case with M pigeons and N boxes where N is less than M. And then there you can also make statements about how many, um, if there is a box with um, many, uh, a number of pigeons. Okay, um, in quantum mechanics, this is not true uh, in a following sense. So say that now we are considering that these pigeons are quantum, so they're some sort of quantum particles and the total Hilbert space of our system is the tensor product of the uh, Hilbert spaces of these three particles. And then we choose a basis in each of these Hilbert spaces, um, and the basis will be spanned by two states, sorry, the space will be spanned by two states, uh, L and R, uh, by L we label, this is the left box, and by R we label the right box. Right? And same for these two. So basically for each particle we say it can either be in a left box or it can be in a right box. Um, and then we, to begin with, we prepare our particles or pigeons in the state um, which I will call big phi. This is the state on all three systems, which is basically the plus state on all three pigeons. Okay. Um, so if we take any of these two particles, um, then the probability to find them in the same box is not zero for uh, for any particle, any two particles given this state. So, for example, if we take the particles one and two, then to write down the condition um, of finding them in the same box, we just need to write the projector corresponding to that condition. So, basically, uh, this projector has to project onto the states, which um, onto the subspace which is spanned by the um, by the projectors corresponding to both of these particles being in the left box or both of these particles being in the right box. So it's going to be left, 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 one, two, plus right, 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 one, two. 
Um, okay. And the same is logic applies for the projector corresponding to finding them in a different boxes. So this is, so the first one is the first particle is in a left box, the second particle is in a right box. And the other way around. Okay. Um, okay by the way, if you, if you have any, any questions uh, to this process or have had any questions during the lecture, uh, please shoot away. I can do it a bit slower. Um, okay, uh, so my first statement would be, I already made it, that the probability to find particles to uh, one and two in the same box, given this state, um, is non-zero. Uh, so basically what we need to calculate, we need to calculate phi, uh, the projector corresponding to the being in the same box, phi. Um, so, yes, so maybe here, this is obvious, but I'll just write that plus is the superposition of L and R with the correct uh, normalization. Then if we calculate this, which is fairly easy because we know that um, the tensor product of plus with L or R is one over square root of two. So basically what we would get is uh, L or maybe let me just write it way again. This the plus. It's gonna be plus plus I discard the third system because the projector does not act on that subsystem. Then here we get LL, LL plus R, 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 A, and here we get plus, plus. So, uh, what we would get, so here we would get um, the first term would be plus L, L plus, uh, and the same for the second system. And here the same for the uh, second projector. And what we would get here is, let me see, Gonna be plus plus, so it's gonna be half, half. This half and half of the plus L is one over square root of two plus r to one over square root of two. So what we get is the first term one over square root of two one fourth because it's going to be one half by one half plus one fourth from the second term, so it's going to be one half. Okay? Um, and in the same way, we can calculate the probability of them being in different boxes given this state, and it's also one half. So right now there is no any contradiction because all these statements that we made are probabilistic. So uh, particles one and two with probability one half, they can be in the same box or they can be with the same probability in different boxes. And just to note, this applies to 
any uh, pair of the particles chosen out of these three particles because all the states are symmetric with respect to each other. So you can always permute the systems. Okay, now uh, let us see in which sense this can be paradoxical. So uh, basically you want to show that there are instances in which we can guarantee that no two particles, uh, that there, there are no two particles which are in the same box. And for that, we uh, imply the following technique. So um, we subject the particles to a second measurement. So basically, we first prepare them in a, in a state phi, and then um, we subject them to the second measurement, or as we call it, post-selection, uh, in the basis um, plus i for each particle. So this is the eigenbasis of the y operator for each particle. Um, so plus i is just the L uh, plus i r squared of 2. OK? Uh, and, and then we can still, given these preparation state phi, and this post-selected state psi, we can still ask the question whether, for example, the particles one and two are in the same box. Um, and for this, uh, okay, one, one, one thing that we, just as, as a sanity check, what we can check is uh, if we prepare our pigeons in this initial state, can we even um, get that state out as a post-selected state? Or can we even measure, make that second measurement with non-zero probability? And indeed we can because the overlap between these two states, psi and phi, so is uh, bigger than zero. So you can calculate the overlap so indeed, the probability of post-selecting on that state is non-zero. Um, okay, so suppose that, um, so we prepared our state in state phi. Then we ask the question of are the particles one and two in the same box? Uh, asking the question in quantum mechanics corresponds to making the measurement and then projecting into um, the corresponding subspace. So we get the state uh, let's say psi prime or phi prime phi prime which is our projector um, on the initial state with some normalization, but uh, this we don't care that much about now. We'll see why. Uh, so, let me just write it. So LL plus RR. Uh, this is on the first and the second system. And our initial state is plus one plus two plus three, okay? And what we get out is uh, one half. We again use the fact that the tens of, oh sorry, the scalar product between L and plus is one over squared of two. Get LL one and two plus RR on one and two and plus on the third pigeon. Okay, so we ask her the question, so are they in the same box?
Um, now, let us look at the probability of uh, post selecting on the state psi. So, uh, we need to look at the psi scalar product phi prime. However, if you look, um, if you make the calculation as they did it in the lecture, you will see that uh, these two states are in fact orthogonal to each other. This mathematically mostly comes out of the fact because we have the i here, <coughs> which i squared turns into the minus and um, the terms cancel out. So basically, uh, we just see that the, the state after asking this question, after projecting into the subspace corresponding to the pitches one and two being in the same box, uh, we're no longer able to post-select um, on our final state. So basically what we looked at was this expression. Okay, so basically um, this, this constitutes this uh, quantum pigeonhole principle that um, if we prepare the pigeons uh, in the state phi and then we choose to pass select them in this state psi, then um, if we would want to measure and ask the question in between whether the pigeons one and two are in the same box, then we, would, uh, we wouldn't find them in the same box, essentially. Uh, and this can be repeated for any pair of the pigeons because the state is symmetric. So what, would, what we would get is the same expression for the pairs two and three and one and three. So zero and also for the one and three. This is also zero. Which means that um, we have three particles, we have two boxes and none of the, uh, there is no pair of the particles which can be found in the same box. Which kind of contradicts our our classical understanding of uh, of the Dirichlet principle, but it's not uh, itself, of course, striking per se because unlike um, unlike classical pigeons, we can put our pigeons into a superposition of being in a, in a superposed state, being in a left and a right box, which will be inherently quantum. And also, you need to remember that. Um, most of the para I mean most of the paradoxes, specifically also paradoxes in quantum theory, they they stem from the fact that we we allow for this pre and post selection. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, basically, we the, usually the experiment goes as oh we prepare a system in a particular state, and then in the end we measure it in a in a different state, uh, and then we try to reason about um, what happens in between. Um, but one, can, one should also remember that this reasoning, uh, it applies to the case where um, we start to, we, when we start to think, oh, what would happen if we would ask the question of whether the particles one and two are in the same box? And uh, yeah, in a quantum theory, asking the question is always about the measurement. Okay, so... This, uh, this setting can be generalized. Um, to n particles or pigeons. And m boxes. Where number of particles is bigger than the number of boxes. 
Okay, so then the pre-selected state or prepared state for these um, n particles is the following. So basically, let's see, uh, zero, one, so on, zero, uh, n with the state zero. Uh, for the j particle is the equal superposition of the particle being in boxes 1, 2, and so on until m. So the state kj corresponds to the j particle being in the kth box. And then each particle is prepared in the equal superposition of being in each box. And the state we will post select in is state psi, which is, we'll write it as eta, so on, eta n, where the state for each particle, eta j, is equal to. 1 over square root of m sum from 1 to m. So basically it would be kind of the same superposition, but we'll add phase to each um, element. It's going to be i e to the power i pi k over m k. So for example, here you can see that the case of three particles and two boxes, you would only have um, two elements in the sum, and this will correspond to the plus state, and this will correspond to, uh, again, sum of two elements, the first being in the first box, and then the second being, um, e, uh, being in the second box with the phase e to the power ip, uh, which is i. Um, so, then the projector corresponding to, for example, the particles 1 and 2 being in the same box, similarly as before, we can just write it as sum over all boxes, and then for each box we write um, the projector for these two particles. So being in this box two or maybe I'll just write it in a better way if I can find the thing. So So n, n in the first box, then the product n, n in the second box. Sorry, uh, first particle in the nth box and second particle in the nth box. And that's for all boxes. Okay, so then uh, the final thing that we need to calculate is this probability to post-select, so we have in a state psi, given that we found particles one and two in the same box. So again, this probability, and as you can guess, it will again turn out to be zero. So now we can show it. So for both of the states, I'll only include the terms which correspond to the first and second particle because this projector is only acting on them. Uh, and the rest will uh, just result in identity. 
Okay, uh, so basically what we have is eta one, eta two, sum n, n on one, n, n on two, and here we have the zero on one and zero on two. So just a note, given that, given this form of zero and eta, what we find, for example, is that if we take a scalar product of n and zero for some n, it will only give you, it will only leave one of the, the sum components alive, where our k is equal to n. So this will be one over square root of m. Uh, analogously here, if you take the tensor product of eta and n, only one term will survive, and what we'll get is one over square root of m um, e to the power minus i p n over m. Okay, given these two things, let us massage this equation. Um, so here we have a scalar product of eta and n, and here n and zero. So sum I will take out. Uh, so I'll get one over square root of m e to the power minus i p n over m, one over square root of m, and the same for the uh, Hilbert, uh, for the scalar products in the Hilbert space of the second particle. Okay, so what we get is one over m squared, sum from n equal one to m, um, e to the power minus two pi i n over m. And this is in fact just zero. So why is it zero? You can just, the easy way to see this is uh, look at this um, elements of the sum e to the power uh, minus two pi i n over m as the vectors on the unit circle in a complex plane. And you sum up over all these vectors, always rotating by the same angle, and in the end, the sum will give you zero. And hence, again, the same argument as previously applies. So there, there, are no, there exists no pair of the particles which can be found in the same box. But it's a general. Okay, so a few comments on, on this whole um, setup. And I'll let you have a break. So this is uh, kind of this setup is interesting because even though that we pre-select and post-select on the states which are uh, where particles are not correlated, um, we uh, we still we still can discover some correlation by asking the question of whether the particles one and two are in the same box. Uh, here it's important to, to understand that by the virtue of, of kind of asking about the correlation, um, we already would project the state of the initially uncorrelated particles into a correlated state. Um, and basically also, if, um, if we measure, if we just take our initial and final state and we measure the particles individually, so for each particle we just ask, or are you in a left box or are you in a right box, then we will find them uncorrelated. And again, if we ask a question about their correlation, we'll find them correlated. This is um, kind of an interesting uh, consequence of the fact that um, in quantum mechanics, measurement is always a projector, and then if you ask about correlation, you will get the correlation 
as long as the probability is non-zero. Uh, yes, and um, also in some sense, global measurements which ask about correlation are always um, in some sense better than um, detailed measurements um, as they can minimize the disturbance. So for example, if you, if you just have a state uh, of two particles, then if you measure the state uh, in, a, in a basis, in a computational basis for each particle, then you will disturb the state. However, if you, uh, you will disturb the correlations between particles, but however, uh, in the case where you just ask about the general, uh, some global, do some global measurement um, on the global system and ask about the correlation between two particles um, and globally, then uh, it would then the state would not be disturbed. Uh, so there is there is basically some trade-off between um, having exact uh, exact information about each particle or having information about the correlations between them. Uh, yes, and also um, in this in this sense, the entanglement uh, resource which is needed to to make these measurements uh, on a global system. Uh, it, it is needed to reveal the correlations between the two systems. So for that, you already need the entanglement resource. Okay, uh, so now you can have a break and we will continue, let's say in uh, 12.35. If you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, yes. So in a so in a sense again, um, one thing to remember is um, essentially also first this is not a good example of the paradox because here uh, I would say it's more of a principle. It's more of a kind of connecting to um, trying to ask the same question as in a classical sense with this Dirichlet principle and uh, like classical pigeons and trying to find a quantum situation where this would go wrong, which where of course it would go wrong because uh, classical pigeons are not allowed to be in, prepared in a superposed state. Uh, however, another, another very important thing to remember is that whenever you look at quantum paradox or any sort of paradox, the essence of it is that uh, there is no joint probability distribution which would be valid with respect to marginals. And that's it. Yeah. Then you can, of course, then elevate these paradoxes to the points where you kind of you introduce agents, and then you assign particular logical statements to the agents, and then they don't um, go very well with each other and lead to a paradox, a paradox like a contradiction, inconsistency, call it whatever you want. But in the end, uh, one can always uh, kind of repel this by saying, "Oh, look, there is no." joint probability distribution of values. So you can't make that statement. But locally, sometimes statements you can make. Yes. Yes, uh, so yes. So usually the, usually the paradoxes are used to formulate so-called so -go, so, so no-go theorems. So no-go theorems are a type of theorem where there is a bunch of, you postulate a bunch of axioms, then based on these axioms you um, you kind of you come up with a thought experiment which, which uses all these axioms, and then at the end of the thought experiment, you get some inconsistency. And that should point out to the fact that uh, one of your initial assumptions was wrong. So, yeah, I think that's the main kind of, that's, that's how these paradoxes can be used as a tool to analyze theories. Uh, here, as I said, it's not like here, it's, there is nothing wrong per se, because um, kind of the statement here is that somehow for the quantum pigeons, the principle, this Dirichlet principle, 
as for classical uh, pigeons wouldn't work. But there is no, as in stark inconsistency or contradiction here, because stark inconsistency would be, for example, um, I don't know, I'm measuring a device a system in the lab and I get uh, outcome zero and you outside the lab somehow predict my outcome with all um, with respect to the theory and you, and you tell me that my outcome should be one. So that is an, an inconsistency. Uh, this is not an inconsistency, this is just a peculiarity, I would say. Okay, so let's continue with the pre and post selection paradoxes. So I'll again repeat this um, formal framework that Lydia presented in the lecture. And we'll have one example where we'll see how this framework works. And then at home, you'll need to kind of repeat this procedure for Hardy's paradox. OK, so we impose selection paradoxes. So again, our system is prepared initially in some state. Mm. Let's say this time is psi. So prepared in psi. Uh, then there is an intermediate projective measurement which corresponds to us asking some question about the system. And uh, it's the projectors are these MJs. Sorry, uh, maybe I'll just write it as before. So it's so set M, which is the projectors Js. Uh, and then we have final projective measurement or post selection um, onto phi. Okay, so now let us calculate some things. So, first, uh, the probability of um, getting the outcome pj corresponding to the projector PJ in the intermediate me measurement and also passing the post selection phi given the initial state psi and the set of projectors M. This is of course given by, so we project onto, so we use the projector uh, on the state psi, then we pass the post selection and the probability is then given by the square. Okay, uh, then the marginal probability, the total probability of passing the post selection is of course this, all these terms summed over J. So here I don't, I don't, I don't mind which uh, result, which outcome I would get. Um, but I just want to pass the post selection given my measurement. Sum over J of this term. Okay, and this allows us to, uh, to write down what are the probabilities for uh, our intermediate measurement so P of PJ given the uh, post selection, preparation, and the set of projectors, which is the ratio between these two.
Okay. Uh, so let us only consider the simple case where our uh, projector family M only consists of two projectors, namely the projector P and its complement. So M is P and identity minus P. Uh, so then let us abbreviate. So we'll call the probability of getting outcome corresponding to the projector P given this, this scheme uh, as just P of P given the pre and post selection and the probability of uh, passing post selection given the pre uh, and the measurement projectors as just the P of phi given psi. Okay, so suppose that these probabilities of get of measuring P given psi and phi are only zero or one. For uh, projectors P, which are in the set, um, let's call this set, I don't know, A. Yes? Ah, P, P it means that, um, yeah, so that we measured. Uh, yeah, we can say we just applied that projector. So we measured something that uh, corresponds to that projector. So, oh yes, I mean the P P is a projector, right? But uh, basically, we can see this operation, intermediate operation, as a projective measurement with respect to that projector. Mm, so, for example, um, like for a qubit, this M can be yeah, 0, 0, and identity minus 0, 0, which is 1, 1. Uh, then here, P means that, um, means 0, 0, which, which means that as a result of intermediate measurement, projective measurement, I'll go to outcome 0. And I projected the, the system into the state zero. Okay, um, that that is more or less clear. Okay, good. Um, yes, so, so this is uh, some finite set of projectors for which these are ones or zeros. Uh, then we can define so-called partial Boolean algebra, which is generated by the set of projectors A. So uh, let me write it down. So basically it would be the smallest set of projectors, uh, A prime, in which the original set A would be contained, uh, and for which these three conditions that Lily also row down would hold. So we'd have a partial Boolean algebra A prime such that A is a, a subset of A prime. Um, 
and it's a smaller set of protectors such that uh, if P is in A prime, then one minus P is also in an A prime. So it's closed under um, this complement negate or negation procedure. Uh, if P and Q are in A prime and they commute uh, and PQ equals QP, then um, PQ is also in A prime. And if uh, P and Q uh, is are in A ah sorry I think that's that's it for now sorry that were not the three conditions uh, because they don't concern the probability function so basically what this means is that we initially have the set of a projectors A for which this probability is only zero or one. Then for this set of projectors, we kind of uh, find a bigger set of projectors, which can be equal to, to A itself, which completes the set in a logical sense. So you can always think about each projector corresponding to some statement, logical statement about the system. Like for example, um, uh, if I again take our example with our qubit, the projector zero zero, um, it corresponds to the to the to making the statement that for uh, my system is in the state zero, or its complement corresponds to the statement my system is in the state one. Uh, and if you if you have this um, mapping between projectors and logical statements, then to have a full logical uh, closed under these logical um, consideration systems, you need that for each statement you have its negation, um, which basically is this um, uh, condition. So if there is a projector, then we can always find its complement. Uh, and the second condition is if I have two, two projectors such that they commute, so I can basically I can ask some two questions in, in any order I like, and they don't um, intervene with each other, then I can always ask the join question. So in a sense, this is about um, like conjunction of two, um, two propositions that you can find. So for example, if I have, um, I don't know, so yeah, for example, uh, one example is one that Lydia had in a lecture about these are projectors on two separate systems, then they commute, um, then we, we should also be able to ask just these two questions together as one question. So is the first system in the state one and the second system in the state one? Or for example, uh, it can be, they, these can be projectors on the same system, but for example, they are orthogonal to each other so for example, zero, zero and one, one. Um, then in principle, this corresponds to a bit idiotic, but po possible question of, is my system in a state zero and in a state one? For which you would get zero, but still, you can ask the question. It's important that they commute because then we, we, are, sh we are sure that the order of the, of the statements in a conjunction will not affect uh, the final answer. Okay, uh, now given this uh, bigger kind of logically complete uh, set of projectors, we can extend the probability function to that set. because we already have our probability function for the smaller set A. 
now for the set A prime, mm. we extend the probability function and we call it F of P. And this has the probability of uh, getting, projecting onto P, uh, psi phi, given pre and post selection. Uh, and we extend from uh, P projectors in A to projectors in A prime, such that now the three conditions come in. These are for these extension on the probability function. Um, so first, for all P's in A prime, um, F of P has to be a valid probability. So it should lie somewhere between zero and one. Second, uh, so F of identity is one. So this is kind of um, the probability of the whole um, event space, so to say. Uh, and F of zero is zero. And F of zero event. Uh, okay, and the final one is about how we calculate the union in some sense. So if we have P and Q, which are in the A prime and they commute. Okay, so then F of PQ minus P plus Q minus PQ equals F of P plus F of Q minus F of PQ. Okay, um, so in some sense, the the intuition for this for this statement is about um, when you think about P and Q as um, sets in the in the probability space, so or um, corresponding to some st statements about the about the system, and then kind of computing their union is about taking P, taking Q, and kind of uh, div um, then su summing them and then taking out this part, which is their intersection, which is in some sense the, uh, the PQ. So this is kind of an intuitive logical explanation why this statement is here. Okay, so, and then if this is not possible, this extension not possible, then we have a paradox in the sense of uh, pre and post selection. Uh, so, practically what this means is uh, whenever you have this pre and post selection situation which um, leads to some inconsistency, or if you want to check if it leads to some inconsistency, you just find some, um, you just find one of, that one of these conditions does not hold, or one of these conditions contradicts um, the other two. Okay. So, uh, to, sh to see this on the example, let us consider another paradox, which is called uh, three box paradox. Which is an example of pre and post selection paradox. So we have one ball. Uh, and it's described you can you can think of it as about it as a cutret. Uh, the Hilbert space is spanned by these three states. 
uh, by the basis of these, these three states. And what do these three states mean? The first state means that it's in a first box. Uh, the second is that it's in a second box. And the third one means that it's in a third box. Okay. Uh, and our pre and post selection will be given by the following. The system is prepared in the state one over square root three, one plus two plus three. So the equal superposition of the ball being in um, each of the box, any of the boxes. And we will post select on the state phi, which is given by uh, one plus two minus three. Okay. Um, and then we ask certain questions. So, for example, uh, we ask whether uh, is the is the ball in a box one. This corresponds to the following um, projector family. So it's either in a box one or it's not. Uh, then we can calculate the probability uh, of it being in a box one given the pre and post selection. Okay, and this probability is given uh, by this uh, expression there, as we have seen. So what we will need to calculate is the following. So we have phi, we have our projector, one, one, we have psi. Okay. Uh, this is the upper part. And in the denominator, we'll have the sum of two terms. Uh, this corresponding to the projector one one and the next one corresponding to its complement. So phi identity minus one one uh, psi squared. Okay. Uh, where shall I continue? You can already start. So again, just calculate the scalar products of phi and one and psi and one. And the nominator will be easy. Denominator uh, will calculate. So what we'll get for the nominator um, basically, phi 1 would give me 1 over square root of 2. Psi 1 would also give me 1 over square root of 2. So I would get 1 over square root of, sorry, not 2, 3, because there are 3 states in the basis. Times squared. Fine. Then the first term is the same, so one third squared plus the second term. Uh, what we will have is, so our phi, so I can already take how the terms, uh, which correspond to one third and another one third, so we'll have one ninth and here we will have so phi one plus two minus three. Then one my identity minus one one. This is gonna be two two 
plus 3, 3. Uh, and now we have the sign. So it's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3. Okay, modulo squared. Okay, so here we have 1 ninth, 1 ninth plus 1 ninth. Um, so what would survive here? So this, this, and this would survive. And this, this, and this. So there are going to be two terms that survive. Uh, but they're going to be, they're going to cancel each other because one will be with a plus sign and the other one with a minus sign. So it's going to be one minus one. So it's going to be zero. So here we have zero. So we have one. So, uh, we asked the question whether the, given this pre and post selection, um, is the ball in the, in the first box? And we see that the probability of the ball being in the first box, which I can write as in this um, notation of this function f, as one. Okay, because the states, uh, these two states are symmetric with respect to um, the, uh, the states one and two, I can in fact make the same, uh, the same conclusion for the question, for the uh, question, is the ball in a box two? So now I consider the second set of, of my measurement projectors. So let's say that was the first. Now I consider this set. And given this set, I can again calculate uh, this probability of uh, getting this outcome that uh, the system, the ball, is in a box two given the pre and post selection sine phi. And I will go through identical calculation and I will get one, outcome one. Uh, so you can already see that this kind of leads to a paradoxical conclusion because, or seemingly leads to a paradoxical conclusion because I asked the question, is the ball in the first box? And the answer is yes. Is the ball in the second box? Also yes. Uh, why is it a paradox in, this, in a sense of pre and post selection? Because uh, by writing, by virtue of writing that f of 1, 1 equals 1 and f of 2, 2 equals 1, we already assumed that there indeed exists this probability function extension that would, uh, that in which both of these conclusions would logically coexist. Uh, however, let us check uh, whether all these, whether these function f uh, indeed satisfies all these three conditions. Actually, for that, we we'll only need to check the last third condition. So, assume that such function exists f, and we check the third condition. Uh, so. Then we take this as p, we take 2, 2 as q. Uh, they trivially commute because they are orthogonal. Uh, and now we need to calculate the f of 1, 1 plus 2, 2, uh, which is so it's going to be minus pq, but pq is zero. So what we get is f of one one uh, plus f of two two, um, 
minus f of p cubed, but that's f of zero, which is by the second uh, rule zero. So here we use the third rule. Uh, here we use the second rule, but both of these are one. So we get that f of some projector, uh, which should also be in the uh, in the set uh, is two, which contradicts the first. Uh, condition for for this probability function f. Uh, okay, and hence by this you kind of see that actually even though you can make these two statements, uh, they they are not uh, permitted in, to logically coexist in the same probability, in, in the same in the same probability function space. So in some sense, it's the same as saying, oh, there, there is no global probability distribution for which both of these things would be a correct, uh, correct marginals. And um, hence, there is, uh, there is this logical pre and post selection paradox. Um, OK. so. The same, the same procedure can also be done for the Hardy's paradox. Um, and yeah, but this is your homework, basically. Uh, and I think Lydia would also do it uh, in the lecture, in a, in a Wednesday lecture, sorry, or tomorrow's lecture, uh, if, I, if I understood her correctly. So you can also just wait until then. Um, Okay, I think this is everything I wanted to say for today. Uh, any questions? I know that these usually needs to be, um, I don't know, processed a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Good question. So, you know, let like me see. So, hmm, sorry, no, 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 it doesn't. Um, it's a very good question. Maybe I missed the assumption that for any P and Q, the P plus Q should be in the set. Um, Well, I mean, in this case, for example, one, one, and two, two are trivially in the set because you can also ask the third question of, is the ball in the third box, right? And this would be the complement to that question, which should lie in the, um, in this probability, uh, sorry, in this projector uh, set. Um, but here. Yeah, okay, I cannot answer this question now. I need to look in the in the original paper. Perhaps I missed the assumption that P plus Q should be in the set. But thanks for pointing it out. Um so basically uh the third, uh, the third, the third condition only works in a case where um, I am, I'm put the argument of the function f is something meaningful, right? So basically, we also for that we also need to satisfy that p plus q minus p q is in the set a prime. 
or maybe actually by just saying, uh, by just postulating this third condition, we implicitly say that p plus q minus pq is in the set. Yeah, not sure, sorry. Okay, no questions? Yeah, thank you very much. See you next week.